Okay, so we are going to finish the book of Titus today. And so this morning, this is called a final word on relationships. And this is how Paul closes his letter. See, the church is a family. We know this, right? The church is a family. We're the family of God. He's the father, and we're all brothers and sisters together. We're bound together in faith by the Spirit. Ephesians 4, 4 through 6 says, There is one body, one Spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. So we are one. And our task is to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. But we live in a tension that forces us to exercise both love and discernment. We have to be able to test because there's two extremes in the faith. And there's a, there's a tendency for the pendulum to swing in extremes. And that is that we end up becoming all affirming or all rejecting. And so we must wrestle between liberalism and legalism, flesh and spirit, law and grace. We have to wrestle with these tensions. There are many who claim that they simply sit in the middle But truthfully, there is no middle because we're always pulled. And so we must exercise love and discernment. What does that mean? What am I talking about? It just means that we don't always simply deal with doctrines. This isn't just a a head game for us. There aren't just random, faceless philosophies that are floating around in space and we're trying to discern those. What we're really dealing with is people. Jesus said, I am the truth. He he embodies the whole realm of truth in a person. Similarly, Satan is called the father of lies. By his very nature, he's characterized by this philosophy of, of lies. And so while it's easy to stand up here and war against universalism and legalism and secular humanism and worldliness. It's easy to just sit there and throw stones at random things, but in the end, we have to deal with people. These are the same people who believe and promote these things, and we have to to deal with that. There's no time more present when we're talking about relationships than the holiday season, right? Right? Because even if we're reclusive during the course of the year, we're forced into relationships, sometimes all of them at once. And we have to deal with that. And so we have to get very good at trying to figure out, okay, is this worth going to war over or can this wait till next year? You know, We have to uh, deal with people. The Bible teaches that other people are not the enemy. And we've talked about that before. We went through spiritual warfare. We, we were talking specifically from the Scripture, and Paul says it over and over again, that the enemy is not other people. It's not. But sometimes people are used by the enemy. And God tells us that we must exercise discernment in how we deal with people who, who are erring, who make mistakes. Jude 22 and 23 He writes, Have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. To others show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. And what he's talking about is is levels of dealing with people. And so he says, people who are are doubting, who are kind of don't really know on the fence, we we have to show mercy to those people and care for those people and welcome them in and try to love them and encourage them. There's other people who are really caught in the midst of it. They're, they're, they're in the fire, he says. And we have to work hard and be careful, but snatch them out and save those people. And there's other people, says the garment, which is talking about, I believe, priestly robes. There are people who are so ingrained in false teaching that they're actually proponents of it. They teach it. And he says we have to be very, very careful with how we approach those people. And so there are levels of, of discernment here. And it's not, it's not as black and white as, okay, this person gets this kind of treatment, this person gets that. In the end, to maintain unity in this church, we have to be discerning. 
We have to learn how to show mercy. Mercy is, is withholding a judgment or retribution that, that might be deserved, but we, we, you restrain. And you say, no, out of love I'm going to show restraint, show mercy. To maintain unity in this fellowship, we must show compassion. True compassion. Striving to rescue people. But unity also requires of us that we properly deal with error. And as the church, we must pursue unity, but also guard against impurity. In the end of Paul's letter to Titus, he concludes with very explicit words about divisive people. But he also expresses love for faithful friends. And all of this is his final word on relationships to Titus on the island of Crete. So if you would turn to the book of Titus, if you're not already there. Now, at the beginning of Paul's letter, he addresses divisive false teachers. Remember this from several months ago? These people had infiltrated their way into the church, and they were stirring up problems and trying to divide and pull people away. And he says, uh, very plainly in verse 10, he says, For there are many who are insubordinate, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision party, which is the Judaizers, the religious groups. He says, they must be silenced since they are upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful gain what they ought not to teach. One of the Cretans, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith not devoting themselves to Jewish myths and commands of people who turn away from the truth. To the pure, all things are pure. But to the defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. Both their minds and consciences are defiled. They profess to know God, but they deny Him by their works. They're detestable and disobedient, unfit for any good work. So already he's dealt with this issue. He's already brought the church through this. And he spells out this as a reason for leaders in the church. He says, this is going to happen. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. And so because this does happen, we need leaders. But this issue is still pressing on Paul's mind when we get to the end of the letter. And we'll see how Paul has a strategy for how he hopes to squash this false teacher problem. But as we close out, we're going to look at verses 8 through 15, the end of the letter. Paul says, this is a trustworthy saying. He's referring to everything we've talked about previously in the chapter. He says, a trustworthy saying. And I want you to insist on these things so that those who've believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These things are excellent and profitable for people. Verse 9, but... Avoid foolish controversies, genealogies, dissensions, and quarrels about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. As for the person who stirs up division, after warning him once and then twice, have nothing more to do with him, knowing that such a person is warped and sinful, he is self-condemned. When I send Artemis or Tychicus to you, do your best to come to me at Nicopolis, for I have decided to spend the winter there. Do your best to speed Zenos, the lawyer, and Apollos on their way. See that they lack nothing. And let our people learn to devote themselves to good works, so as to help cases of urgent need and not to be unfruitful. All who are with me send greetings to you. Greet those who love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. And so in Paul's parting words to Titus, to his church plant. He deals with three kinds of people, and we're going to see them this morning. Number one, we're going to look at factious people, factious people, people who cause division. Number two, we're going to see faithful servants, those who are faithful. And then finally, we're going to talk about friends, his friends. So number one, let's talk about the factious people. This is verses 9 to 11. See, Paul structures this argument in kind of a, a unique way. It's, it's, a, it's like a sandwich, okay? So if you're a 
person who's into literary, it's A-B-B-A, okay? It's bread, meat, meat, bread. Now, what I'm talking about is this. In verse 8, he talks about believers. He starts with believers. And then at the end of verse 8, he says what believers are devoted to, which is good works. So believers and what they're devoted to. And then in verse 9, he switches and says, this is what people who are on the other side devote themselves to. Controversy, strife, quarreling. And this is unprofitable and worthless. And then in verse 10, he actually names those people who were devoted to those things. Divisive, factious people. Now let's examine the content of what is unprofitable, this obsession. So Paul's first order of business is to tell the church to avoid such chatter. Peristomai, it's to literally to go around or to shun, to turn away from. So what are we to avoid as a church? And this is important, believers, because we're moving forward. We, we have to know what hill to die on and what hills not to die on. What's important to fight for and what we can hold loosely. Things we have to face head on and things we should really go around. We have to discern these things. So what to avoid? And the first thing he says is foolish controversies. The word foolish is literally... Uh, it means stupid, moros, it means stupid. These are things that are non-essential to salvation and are useless for our time. Now, now there is much in the faith, I want to be clear, there's much in the faith that is non-essential to salvation, but still really good to talk about. Not everything is, is fruitless. And so we should never divide on non-essentials. The tendency sometimes is to shun all doctrine together and say, well, since that's you know, doctrine and we could possibly divide over it, I don't want to talk about it. Well, no, we need to talk about it. We need to be a church that devotes themselves, ourselves, to learning what God has to say about life in this world. We need to learn doctrine. I think healthy discussions about minor doctrines can be a really good thing because it stimulates our thinking and it stirs our affections. But that's not, I don't think, what Paul's addressing here. He says these are foolish controversies. Meaning these are the stupid things that Christians argue about. When I was in seminary, my very first theology paper was a position paper on the difference in the case for superlapsarianism versus infralapsarianism. And it was a lot of fun. But in the end, it was completely pointless because Scripture is not 100% clear on it. And nobody in their right mind would divide over this issue. And I won't even tell you which, which stance I took, because it's that foolish. Not to say these things are foolish, but here's, here's where it becomes foolish. When we argue about these things, that's when it shifts from the discussion to the foolish. When we divide and argue over these things. Again, it was fun to talk about that kind of stuff, but not to divide over it. Warren Wiersbe, who is a Bible teacher, he wisely wrote this, I have learned that professed Christians who like to argue about the Bible are usually covering up some sin in their lives, are very insecure, and are usually unhappy at work or at home. He says there's always something behind divisiveness. He says there's something deeper when we pick fights on this stuff. There's something deeper. Again, this is not, again, to, to, to bad mouth talking about doctrine, but again, as soon as it becomes a point of argument, it's foolish. Paul said, avoid foolish controversies. Number two, he said, avoid genealogies. Now, at face value, this doesn't seem obvious to us. Some of you might have a heart check and go and delete your Ancestry.com account, and that's not what Paul's talking about. What he's talking about is this, um, this practice that Jewish scholars would do. They would talk about these inane things. They'd go through the Torah, through the, the Old Testament, and through the law, and they would actually like, assign numerical values to certain letters, and they would trace genealogy and try to find some hidden meaning inside the text. And they would presuppose all this stuff on the text that's just not there. They would make it mean more 
than it means. And they would build whole doctrines around these ideas. And they would divide over it. They'd argue about numerology. And some of these things are hard to nail down because there's not a very good uh, documentation of what these controversies were. They were that foolish. But in the end, they were speculating into a text to try to create religious meaning that just wasn't there. Paul said, avoid these kinds of speculations, these genealogies. Third thing he says is, avoid dissensions. And here he's talking about general strife. In our world, it's typically the subject of most church business meetings, just fighting over stuff, just strife. Argument simply for the sake of argument. Typically, this is something that's a, that's a small issue that could easily be cleared up if people were just talking to each other. Just a little bit of communication could solve it, but instead it blows up and becomes dissension and problems. Paul says, avoid strife, avoid dissensions. Paul says elsewhere, so much as it depends on you, be at peace with all people. He says, work hard at this. You got something hanging on from your past? Don't don't capitalize on that. Find a way to forgive, to extend mercy, to show some grace. Don't, Don't divide over that. I think this becomes timely again in the holiday season. Avoid dissensions. And the fourth thing he says is avoid quarrels about the law. 2 Timothy 2.23, Paul writes, have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. And he says, you know they breed quarrels. Causes problems. And he says later, earlier in verse 14, it does no good. He says, in fact, it ruins the hearers. When you quarrel about the law, he's talking about Old Testament law. When you quarrel, it actually ruins people who are listening to the, to the argument. They just give up. They go, I'm not going to get into that. And we've seen this, haven't we? All of us have probably been through this or seen this or been part of this or perpetuated this, where you're, you're fighting over something and people around just kind of throw up their arms and they walk away. And then it's just you and this other person arguing about nothing. It ruins the hearers. The law, quarrels about the law, Old Testament law. And the error here is that there are people who are trying to apply all of the law, the Old Covenant, into the new, to New Testament believers. And they were fighting and they were agonizing over this this issue. One example would be Sabbath keeping. And the Pharisees tried to bust Jesus on Sabbath keeping. At one point he's walking through a field and his disciples are picking up heads of grain and rolling them between their fingers to have a little snack. And the Pharisee says, you're you're working, You're, you're not keeping the Sabbath. And Jesus famously said, wisely said, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. You're quarreling about the law. What kind of a person fights over these kinds of things? Turn in your Bibles just a few pages back into 1 Timothy. Paul is talking to his other close disciple, Timothy, who's in Ephesus. At the beginning of the letter, back in verse 3, he says, As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain in Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine, nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies which promote speculations rather than stewardship from God that is by faith. Then he says, the aim of our charge is love. That issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. He says the goal is love here. Verse 6, certain persons by swerving from these have wandered away into vain discussion, desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they are saying or the things about which they make confident assertions. He says they're talking and talking, but they have no idea what they're talking about. These were false teachers that were very similar to the Judaizers on Crete. People who engage in superfluous erudition for no reason at all. No purpose. They have no idea what they're talking about. And these Judaizers, they claimed Christ. They said, yes, we believe in Jesus. But they tried to bind the Old Testament law 
to the conscience of new believers. And they would quarrel endlessly. Back in Titus, Paul says that these kinds of quarrels are unprofitable and worthless. They do nothing to grow faith. They do nothing to advance the gospel. They do nothing to strengthen the body. In the end, they actually damage our witness to unbelievers. They damage our witness. Because all people see from the outside is infighting. All they see is arguing and tearing each other apart. All of us have been caught up in this at some point or another. Again, this does not mean that we don't plumb the depths of theology. Homer Kent, who's a scholar, he writes, Although Titus must never compromise the truth, he must not descend to the level of bickering and fighting. Such a situation is likely to grant a sort of standing to the false teacher and confuse the unlearned. Fightings disturb those who are not well grounded in the faith and do not produce pure conduct in older Christians. So they don't help the, the new believers, doesn't help the older believers, does nothing. So verse 10, Paul explores the kind of person who does this. And he calls them hereticos anthropos, a person who stirs up division. But literally, it's a, a heretical person, a heretic. We've all heard that word before. A heretic is a person who chooses to follow doctrine that is contrary to the church, that is contrary to sound teaching, that is contrary to the Bible. They follow their own doctrine. And to the point where they become factious and divisive. These people don't submit to the Word of God and they don't submit to church leadership. These people are those who split churches over minor issues. Paul warns about this in Romans chapter 16. He says, Watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine which you've been taught. Avoid them. The King James says, Mark these men. He says, Mark these people. Look out for them. Know who they are and watch out. How do we deal with factious people? Look at the second half of verse 10. He says, after warning, Nuthesia, admonishing, warning, after warning him once and then twice, have nothing more to do with him. If you listen closely, you can, you can hear the words of Jesus in Matthew 18. If he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax gatherer. Right? Have nothing to do with Parai it means to reject, to refuse, to drive them out. Paul says, three strikes and you're out. This seems kind of harsh, doesn't it? A little tough? I would argue no. Because these people are, are proving themselves to be toxic to the body. I'm not talking about someone who has an issue with leadership once and twice and three times. I think what he's talking about is a person who tries to split the church, they repent, get brought back, tries to split the church again, repent, get brought back, and finally the third time tries to split the church and the leadership says, get out of here. Go away. And he says, church, don't have anything to do with those people. They've tried three times. And verse 11 says, knowing that such a person is warped and sinful, he is self-condemned. And the argue is always made, well, we can't be judgmental. And I would argue against that because Jesus, I think, is clear in Matthew 7 that we're to judge righteously. But in this context, we don't have to judge anything because the text says that by his own character and actions, he judges himself. He proves himself, their self, to be warped and sinful or self-condemned. There gets a point to a point where there's just no reasoning with somebody. Their sin has warped their thinking, and God is the one who has to convict them and drive them to their knees to repent. And in fact, the most loving thing the church can do at this point is to reject them. 
Because otherwise we prolong their sin and we, we actually hinder God's work in bringing them to repentance. We slow the growth. We get in the way. See, factious, divisive people are already bent on drawing disciples away from the church and causing division. So by removing them from the fellowship, the church is actually maintaining the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. And this inevitably happens in every church somewhere. The task for us is to be built up in the Word and and committed to unity and be prepared to obey God's will for His church. Why is this here? Why are we talking about this? Because in my possibly naive opinion, we're doing okay. There hasn't been any division. No one's knocked on my door and said, I got a, I got a problem with your doctrine, Pastor. No one's tried to draw disciples away. But the point is, is that someday, some point, this will happen. It happens all the time. And we have to be strong. We have to stick together and remember the, the basic fundamental principles of this. And we need to nip these things in the bud, love each other and show grace and mercy and compassion and, and bear with each other and keep our doctrine sound so that we keep these things far away. We have to grow good, deep, healthy, strong roots. And if our foundation is in the Word of God, in Christ Jesus, through the Spirit of God, by the Father, we'll be okay. But not all people are factious, right? So after being crystal clear about the issue of division, Paul addresses the next group. He moves on. Number two, he talks about faithful servants. He lists four people here who have proved faithful. And he has special instructions for Titus. Look at verse 12. When I send Artemis or Tychicus to you, do your best to come to me at Nicopolis, for I have decided to spend the winter here. Now apart from this text, we know nothing about Artemis. We have no idea who that is. But Tychicus is mentioned quite a bit. He's in Acts chapter 20, verse 4. We know he's from Asia. Ephesians 6 and Colossians 4 says that he is a a beloved brother and faithful minister. In 2 Timothy 4.12, we know that Paul, at the end of his life, sent Tychicus to, to, to Ephesus to minister. So Paul was entrusting faithful ministry to this man. He was a faithful minister and a beloved brother. So Tychicus and, and no doubt Artemis were faithful, trustworthy servants of the gospel. And Paul would be sending one of these men to relieve Titus so that he could come and spend some time with his beloved father in the faith. So where would they meet? They would meet at Nicopolis. Now Nicopolis, for those of you who haven't been there, is on the west coast of Greece. It's about 200 miles from Athens. It's near the Adriatic Sea. And since sailing conditions during winter would be very difficult, Paul and Titus are going to meet there and they're going to stay there. They're going to spend time there. Much like a New England winter, you just kind of close the doors, turn the heat up, and just sort of hang out and watch TV. So they're going to stay there. They're going to lodge there for the winter. Verse 13, he says about the other two, he says, Do your best to to speed Zenos, the lawyer, and Apollos on their way. This is the only place that Zenos is mentioned. But we can actually learn a lot about this person. It says he's a lawyer. Numicos. Now this could mean he's either an expert in the Roman law or he's an expert in the Jewish law. It's unclear. But I think he was an expert in the Jewish law. Why? Because of who he's traveling with. He traveled with Apollos. Now Apollos is mentioned quite a bit in the New Testament. But we get a brief biological sketch of him in Acts chapter 18. Go to Acts 18 if you would. We'll see a a couple things about him. But let's just read these verses. Verse uh, 24 to 28 of Acts chapter 18. Now a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was an eloquent man, competent in the Scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, being fervent in spirit. He spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus 
Though he knew only the baptism of John, he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. But when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. And when he wished to cross to Achaia, the brothers encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. When he arrived, he greatly helped those who through grace had believed. For he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, showing by the Scriptures that Christ, that the Christ was Jesus. So Paulo, Apollos was eloquent. He was competent. And one translation says he was mighty in the Scriptures. What does it look like for a person to be mighty in the Scriptures? Apollos was. And verse 28 tells us that he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, showing by the Scriptures, by the Scriptures, that Jesus is the Christ. So who better to travel with you on your missionary journey than a person who is an expert in Old Testament Jewish law, Zenos? Again, this is not definitive, but what a team that would be, huh? To have these people going out and forcefully explaining the Scriptures and pouring it all out and showing from the Bible, from the Old Testament, Jesus is the Christ. He's the one we're waiting for. And He's come. He was born by a virgin in a manger. He lived and walked on earth, lived sinlessly, and died and resurrected. And now He's empowered the church to live. And they can prove that from the Old Testament. Because there was a predominant problem in the early church. And this was that the Jews were, were wanting to trust in Jesus, but they were so tied to the law that it was, ca- it was a cause for stumbling. They said it was, it was Jesus plus circumcision or plus law keeping. And Apollos would have preached, no, grace through faith. It's by grace you're saved. So Apollos and Zenos were traveling. They would make a stop at Crete. So Paul tells Titus, do your best to speed them along and see they lack nothing. Part of showing how much we love God is showing how much we love His workers. Pastors and teachers and evangelists and missionaries and elders. Remember that over and over again, Paul is telling the church, the Cretans, to engage in good deeds. Be a people of good deeds. In fact, it's mentioned five times in these three short chapters taking care of Apollos and Zenos is a good way to practice these good deeds. And so further, Paul would encourage them again in verse 14. He says, And let our people learn to devote themselves to good works so as to help cases of urgent need and not to be unfruitful. He said, Church, I want you to be fruitful. I want you to do good works, but not just for the sake of good works, but for the sake of fruitfulness. Jesus said, let let them see your good works so that they may glorify your Father who's in heaven. Not say, hey, what a great church you have. No. What a great God you serve. Who is this Jesus that you always talk about? And why are you so kind Devote yourselves to good deeds. This means that you're constantly looking for opportunities. You're seeking out ways to to do good for the sake of Christ. That you care about the quality of what you do. It's not a matter of just saying, here you go, here's a good... No, you care about it. You, You work hard and you say, this is good, I want to give this to you. I want to do this for you. I'm going to shovel out your driveway when it snows, but I'm going to do a good job. So the next time you have a storm, your banks aren't piled up. No, I want to do a nice job for you. Why? Because I love Christ. Because this is what He would do for you. To manifest a good heart when we do good deeds. The Bible says that God loves a cheerful giver. We don't do, do good deeds to get points here. We serve a great Lord who would do the, do the same and more. He would devote himself joyfully to deeds. To devote ourselves means that we pray for God's leading, that you strive 
to get better and better at helping others. Do we aspire to that, church? Do we actually strive? I want to get better at serving people. I want to get better at doing good deeds. I want to get better at identifying needs and identifying ways to not just preach the gospel, but to to live out the fruit of the gospel to people. So that they may see the works and glorify the Father in heaven. And part of the function of a church is benevolence to help in cases of urgent need. And it's not enough that we just send out a check once in a while. We need to meet the needs of others. Their physical needs, their financial needs, their emotional needs, their spiritual needs. To pray for people. I was talking to a missionary the other day. He was talking about how he's garnering support and he knew we were a new church plant. And I said, I want to keep in touch with you. And he says, well, you know, he said, you can support me right now by praying for us. He said, honestly, praying for us is more valuable than sending us money. He says, I want you to pray for us, please. So I have a a card that I've been looking at uh, every day. It's in my office. And it's important, I think, we devote ourselves to praying for other people. I don't do it enough. I I think we need to do it more. Because we want to bear fruit, don't we? We want to be a, a church that's fruitful, that makes a mark here. People see the works and they glorify God. See, the Cretans are prone to laziness and to being unfruitful. So Paul says, don't be like that. Help others. Be fruitful. In doing so, we also have to take care of those who are faithful in service. And the last group of people that Paul talks about is his friends in verse 15. He says, all who are with me send greetings to you. Greet those who love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. If you ever notice in Paul's letters, he's always surrounded with people. Always. He's always talking about other people. In Romans 16, there's actually 16 verses of names of people that Paul surrounds himself with. 16 verses. These are pastors and missionaries and deacons and friends and people who have host homes and disciples and people who are engaged in ministry and were part of the church. Paul was single, but he was rarely alone. He always took someone else along with him. He always ministered with others. And so Titus would have known many of the same people. So he tells them, all who are with me, anybody that I'm around right now, they all send their greetings to you, Titus. And then Paul sends his love to the church. He says, greet those who love us in the faith. Greet those who love us. Then he closes with a, an understated yet glorious greeting. He says, grace be with you all. Grace is God's unmerited, unearned favor. It's His blessing. All of us experience some form of God's grace, even in suffering, especially in suffering. When the odds are against you, when challenges abound, when there doesn't seem to be any way, God's grace sustains us. What is His greatest grace? For I am sure that neither life nor death nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 8. Our greatest grace is that we're loved by God. And Jesus said, I know who is mine and nobody can pluck them out of my hand. There's no way to fall out of God's grace when you're in it. We have a lot to do as a church, don't we? It was a big ministry. Small town, but big ministry. The surrounding towns, the surrounding areas, there are people who've never even heard the gospel. They don't even know who Jesus is. But what we are to do flows out of who we are and whose we are. Who we belong to. 
Like all church plants, whether in Gilmanton or in Crete, we look to God and to His Word. And again, as long as we anchor ourselves to sound doctrine, we keep the love here for each other and for God, we'll be okay. We'll weather the storm. I'm convinced that if we take care of the depth of this ministry, God will be faithful and take care of the breadth. He'll bless the expanse of this body if we're faithful to Him. If we're devoted to Him and we say we are God's, we belong to Him, we're going to work for Him. It's our privilege and our joy to be here. Let's pray. Lord, thank You for the book of Titus. Lord, it's easy to gloss over especially shorter books. But Father, we don't want to miss out on the rich glories of Your truth. Father, we don't want to become unfruitful. We don't want to just meet together the same time every week and just do our thing. We want to gather to encourage, but we also want to to expand and reach out, Lord. So Father, right now, I know in my heart and our hearts, Lord, we're, we're committing ourselves to going as deep as we can in You, into Your Word, into Your truth, into understanding You. But not only that, but to to cultivate the mind of Christ and to discipline ourselves for godliness. To work hard at fighting the flesh, Lord, and living in righteousness, godliness. But Father, we cannot do this apart from Your grace. Lord, apart from You, we can do nothing So Lord, I continuously ask that You would pour out blessing, that You would sanctify Your church, Your body. Help us to sharpen each other to become stronger, but to have an impact on other people, Lord. I pray as Christmas comes near, Lord, I pray that You would fill this place. Your will be done. Even if there's one person who walks in and hears the Gospel and is saved, it's worth it. But Father, we want to be an influence here. We want our fruit to bear here. Father, help us individually. Help us as we approach this season, Lord. Keep us safe. Keep us together. Keep us striving together, Lord, in the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Father, thank You for Your your grace and Your mercy, for sending Your Son to this earth to die in our place. We can't thank You enough. So we ask that you would bless our time together in fellowship. We would encourage each other, spur each other on in love and good deeds. We ask your blessing again in Jesus' name. Amen.